welcome to Stetson Law Live, an online, interactive, informational event for prospective students of Stetson University College of Law. Using Ustream's chat feature, your questions can be answered in real time. And now, your hosts, Dean Christopher Petruskevich and Assistant Dean Laura Zuppo. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Stetson Law Live. My name is Laura Zuppo. I'm Assistant Dean of Admissions and Student Financial Planning. I'm so glad you all logged in tonight. With me is Dean Christopher Petruskevich. Well, thank you, Laura. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. You know, this is uh, an innovation for us here at Stetson, so it's an opportunity for us to be able to connect with the people that we hope are going to join us uh, here in August. You know, one of the big things that I think about Stetson uh, as I decided to join the College of Law six months ago was you always wonder about what a place is like, uh, and then you wonder what it's like when you get here. Uh, and it's just been a fantastic experience, uh, not only as dean, but also as a faculty member. You know, Stetson is one of those places in which we hear about legal education, we hear about what the practical lawyer is all about, and Stetson is one of those places in which we not only talk the talk, but we walk the walk. It's a big place, I think, in which we look at uh, not only the practical implications of law, but also the theoretical implications of law. We have a fantastic legal writing program. We have a fantastic advocacy program. If you want to talk about the different things that law schools do to help lawyers prepare to practice law, those are the two main things that lawyers do. Uh, we have a faculty that is not only involved in legal education, uh, but they come from a practical background, many of them uh, with a lot of legal experience. So, Laura, I'm looking forward to talking with the people who are uh, interested in Stetson Law. Sounds good. All right. What we'd like to do is invite you to type up some questions, ask us about Stetson. Maybe you're curious about the admissions process. Maybe you'd like to know about our curriculum, extracurricular activities, more about the dean. And we're hoping that you're going to just um, participate through chat. And um, what we'll do is, as the questions come in, we will um, moderate this by asking the dean to give us the answers. And um, then we will um, try to engage you as much as possible. So before we get this started, I think we have about 26 or so people logged in right now. Can some folks just type on in? Let's make sure this is working. What states are you guys from? I'm going to see where everybody's located. I think there's a little bit of a delay. Oh, I have a question already. Hey guys, this is great. Lala is asking us what's the first year curriculum like, okay? We have South Carolina, Florida. Who else is out there? Yeah, not too, uh, more Florida, okay, great. Well, let's talk about the first yeah, year. Yeah, let's, let's talk about it. the first year curriculum. So the first year curriculum is something that we've uh, very recently modified uh, here at Stetson, uh, in large part because of the changes in the legal market. So we have the same types of traditional courses that uh, exist at many law schools. So you have constitutional law and criminal law, legal research and writing. Um, our first year program uh, with legal research and writing, for example, uh, is ranked in the top five programs since they've been ranking legal research and writing programs. We try to do it in very, very small sections uh, so that students have the ability to interact with their professors. Uh, the first year curriculum is one that engages students not only in the traditional doctrinal part, uh, but also in the skills-based part. So there's drafting components that are associated with it. Uh, there are small group problems that are associated with first-year courses. All of those things that I think make students uh, and help students get prepared to be able to practice law from the time that they walk in the door uh, until the time that they leave. That's important. And um, Dean Petruskevich, what, what's a typical day in the life of a law student, maybe in terms of class time and study time? Classes are spread out in the first year. That's the only time in which we have a prescribed curriculum. So it's, you don't have to worry about what courses am I going to take in the first semester when I get here? What courses am I going to take in the second semester? We have a prescribed curriculum uh, and we try to spread out the courses so that students take property uh, perhaps on Monday morning in criminal law uh, on Monday afternoon. So we have an opportunity to spread those out. The students have the ability to interact with their professors between classes. You know, I think, Laura, one of the hallmarks uh, of Stetson uh, is that our professors are both available inside and outside of the classroom. So our faculty members uh, are those that have been so engaged in practice that they want to have the ability to interact with students inside and outside of the classroom. So the day in the life is, you know, I think many students approach law school because it's the first time that they've done a professional school and it's very different than undergraduate education. But a big part of that uh, is being able to 
take what you do in the first year curriculum and also engage in other things in many of the extracurricular activities that exist uh, here at Stetson. Uh, we are a campus that's in Tampa Bay. Uh, it's one in which it's a very vibrant community. We have 30, 35, 40 student organizations on campus for people to get involved inside and outside of the classroom. We do 25,000 hours of pro bono service every year. Many of those come from our first year students uh, because we have such a, re a rich and deep connection uh, with our community. That's great. And I'm, I'm excited to see you guys are all coming in and telling us where you're from. And actually, it looks like Chris just asked us a great question about the Yellow Ribbon program. And, and do we plan to continue our participation and maybe even expand our Yellow Ribbon, our Yellow Ribbon support? Absolutely. Uh, so the Yellow Ribbon Scholarship uh, is for those that are veterans. Uh, we have had a very rich connection with our veterans community. So we participated in the Yellow Ribbon program in the past. Uh, we plan to participate in the Yellow Ribbon, Ribbon program in the future, uh, and it's built on really a lot of the interaction that we have with the veterans community in general. Uh, we have a new veterans law initiative, uh, an institute that was started last year, that does a number of different things for our community. After all, Tampa Bay uh, in Florida is a very, uh, is a geographical area in which many members of our armed forces uh, exist. So we have uh, our faculty members and our students helping veterans and their families uh, with veterans issues, with benefits issues, uh, we also match servicemen across the country who are in Afghanistan and Iraq. If they have a legal issue, a foreclosure issue in Sacramento, California, we'll help them find a lawyer in that area. And our students are, are working very closely with our, not only with the law school community, but also with the veterans communities. Uh, with the number of VA hospitals that exist in Florida, uh, our elder law program partners with our advocacy program and partners with our Veterans Institute so that we provide a full range of services to all of our veterans. So, Laura, it's not just about the Yellow Ribbon Scholarship, although that's a big part of it. Uh, it's also very much about how our students are connected with our community. And such, because the veterans are such a big part of our community, we provide a lot, uh, a variety of services, uh, not only to the veterans that are enrolled here in law school, but also to our community. And, and that's actually a really good segue to the next question that we have, and that's coming in from Bernsey. And you asked about scholarships and about the GPA. And actually, Dean, if you're okay with that, I'd like to try to take this question. Um, the, the question is about multi-year GPA, and, and is it based on um, ranking and, and different things? Essentially, we look at students as they're coming in, we're looking at their cumulative undergrad GPA and their LSAT, as well as many other factors. And when we award a scholarship to a student coming in, it's multi-year. Um, we do what we can to support our students to keep it. Most students are going to have scholarships that are just going to require good academic standing, uh, following the honor code, code of conduct, that type of thing. We do have some other kinds of scholarships that require top 50%, but I'm also I'm also really happy about this program we have. It's a probation program. Once in a while, a student doesn't quite make the top 50%, and we actually have a faculty mentoring probation semester for them so that we can help them continue to work toward the top 50%. And then um, I think that, hopefully that answers your question, Bernsey. If not, go ahead and type me a follow-up. But I know, Dean, one of your priorities is scholarships, so I don't I think that it's kind of exciting when um, the dean is talking with alumni. He's really he's really spreading the word about how important it is. Did you want to tell them a little bit about your your goals? Yes, yeah, you know Stetson uh, is an institution in which we think we have a fantastic educational program, and we want to be able to attract the students that match our educational program. And we can only do that with scholarship dollars. We realize that the cost of legal education is growing. The cost of legal education uh, has grown. Uh, well beyond inflation uh, over the last oh, 10 or 15 years. But a big part of that is that we try to look at the scholarship dollars to make sure that you're getting a fantastic educational program. Uh, but when we look at scholarships, we don't just look at LSAT scores and grade point averages. We look at a full file review. We take a look at the whole person, just as we do in the admissions process. We also do that in the scholarship process. Uh, and we have, st we have structured our program that allows the students to be able to retain scholarships. I recognize that many people read about contingency scholarships. That's not something here at Stetson that is a big part of our program. Stetson awards scholarships, and the clear intention is that you keep scholarship for your three years. 
Absolutely. Now we have a question um, again about from Bernsey. I'm so glad you're active. Um, is the library uh, wireless? I think we actually have a lot of wireless areas. The library included classrooms, lots of common areas. I know even in even in our admissions foyer, we have a, a, a courtesy laptop that has wireless access. And do we have collaboration with other universities to access online? I think that you're talking about databases, and I believe the answer is yes. The, an the answer is yes. So. We spend uh, an enormous amount of resources on technology. We are wireless throughout our campus here in Gulfport. We are wireless uh, for our campus in Tampa Bay. Uh, but a big part of that is not only the infrastructure that's necessary for wireless communication, uh, but also the technology infrastructure. We have a fantastic IT staff. Uh, most of our students interact with our IT staff because they are, they are so good at what they do that it gives us the ability not only to be able to have wireless access as it exists, uh, in the library, uh, but wireless access throughout uh, both campuses. You know, a big part of how we collaborate uh, is that our main university is in DeLand, and we're able to capture some of those databases uh, from the library that are used by our main campus, our undergraduate campus in DeLand. Uh, and we have partnerships throughout Florida with many schools uh, that allow us to access databases as a consortium sharing opportunity so that uh, we share the resources throughout Florida. We, we actually have two questions that are aimed at students who are coming in as non-traditional or second degree students. And um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the environment and what it's like for that student coming in as a second or third degree professional. We have, I think, a, a fantastic part-time program. Uh, one of the things uh, as being a law professor for, uh, for 11 years before coming to Stetson, the opportunity to have non-traditional students in a classroom environment gives you the opportunity to interact with those students that don't have those same life experiences that students that have a second and third career. Uh, we think that that is an enormous opportunity for Stetson. Uh, as we were talking about just a little bit uh, earlier about the admissions process, that's part of the reason why we don't just admit students on grade point average and LSAT score, because we take into account the entire student. Uh, Non-traditional students provide a different perspective in the classroom because they've had such life experiences. And so it's an opportunity for us to be able to integrate the traditional students, those that go through undergraduate education uh, and then move on to law school, with those, with those students that have had other careers, they've had life experiences, and we think that that enriches the whole educational environment that exists at Stetson. So non-traditional students, I think, fit in uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, I will admit that I was a non-traditional student. I have my uh, LLM uh, from Georgetown at night. Uh, which means that I integrated with many of the people that were traditional full-time students. And I'm hoping that the experiences they had uh, enriched their educational background because of the work experiences I had at the Department of Justice and other places. And I also learned from them because they came from very different parts of the country. So it's not only the diversity in terms of the traditional versus non-traditional students, but our admissions process is designed so that we take into account students that come from various geographical regions because that provides a very different perspective uh, in a classroom environment if you're coming from an urban environment or you're coming from a rural environment. If you're coming from different socioeconomic classes, all of those provide a different perspective. You know, I've always thought that law schools are one in which you have 52 professors here at Stetson, but you will always learn more from your classmates than you will ever learn from your professors. We're here to help the educational process, uh, but a big part of our admissions process is being able to develop a class that allows the students to be able to learn from one another. I agree. And also to your question, Brian, you asked us about the graduate degree. Graduate degrees are very important. And in fact, 25% of our part-time students typically come in with a graduate degree, typically 6 to 7% of our full-time students. Now, we actually have two questions that overlap a little bit about clinics and one in particular about corporate law. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the skills training, clinical and internship opportunities, and also in particular corporate. Sure. So if we talk about the clinical and skills training that exists here at Stetson, you know, as legal education evolves, uh, as law firms evolve, they're requiring law schools to do more on the front end of the process in terms of training that used to exist in the law firm environment, which means that we have to think about, constantly think about, our curriculum, both in the first year as well as the second and third year curriculum. The reason is, is because the responsibility of law schools is to help more and more law students become better prepared to become lawyers earlier in their careers. 
The reason why we do that uh, is because we provide the skills training here that allows students to be able to have those experiences before they graduate from law school. You know, the first time that, uh, that I appeared in court uh, is when I appeared in court for the Department of Justice. And, you know, it's always a, um, a trying experience when you stand up in court uh, and you stand up and represent, whether it's the government or representing a private client. The ability to be able to do that while you're in law school gives you an opportunity to be able to do that under the supervision of a licensed attorney. It gives you the opportunity to do that while you're still in law school. Uh, last year, we had over 350 different opportunities for our students to, be ga to become involved and more engaged in what we refer to as experiential learning. So it's, clinical, it's the clinical environment, whether it's through the prosecution clinic or the child advocacy clinic, uh, or whether it's skills-based training, so that we're talking about document drafting or trial advocacy. You know, Stetson is one of the only places for someone who's litigated cases for 10 years before becoming uh, an academic. There's two things that work very well when you're talking about litigation, and two things that you really have to know. One is trial advocacy strategy, and the other part is evidence. And we teach those as a tethered course. There's, there's no way that you can ever practice law by understanding trial advocacy without understanding evidence. And there's no way to be able to apply evidence without understanding trial advocacy. One of the innovations in our curriculum is integrating not only the doctrinal, but also with the skills-based training. So we have a number of skills-based opportunities, but we combine those in many cases with some of the doctrinal opportunities. And that's important. I think a lot of students want to know, you know, how do I, how do I build my resume before I even come to law school? And um, one thing that I encourage students to do is network. And we have a question up here about our alumni environment and um, how can alumni get involved or how much involvement do students have with alumni? Might you elaborate on that? Certainly. Uh, the alumni, the group of alumni that exists, you know, Stetson is the first law school in Florida. Uh, it was created initially in 1900. Uh, in the land uh, over near Daytona uh, on, the, uh, on the eastern side of Florida. It moved to Gulfport to our Tampa Bay area in 1954. Uh, and from that process, we have developed uh, over 9,000 alums, uh, many of them throughout the country, a number of them uh, here in Florida, whether it's Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, South Florida. And we have, we are building and continuing to build a network in which our students can interact with our alums as mentors. You know, as I've been traveling around the state talking with our alums about the successes of the College of Law, one of the questions that the alums always ask is, how can we help? And my answer is always the same, is that you can become more involved with our students while they're still in law school. You know, we have a fantastic career development department. Those folks help our students to become prepared for jobs. But we understand that the legal market is different depending on where you are in the country, and even more specifically, where you are within the state. The job market is different in Jacksonville than it is in Orlando, and it's different in Tampa Bay than it is in Miami. It's also different in New York and Atlanta and Washington. So what we are, what we are doing is building an alumni network so that students, when they are still in law school, have the opportunity to be, prepared, to be paired with our alumni in those areas. So it's not necessarily that they are going to provide them with jobs when they graduate, but they're going to be part of their network so that they know that they should become involved in certain organizations in those places because those are the fantastic places to network. You know, I have uh, in our career services office uh, a dean's corner board in which I go and write a message every week. And the message is always about the same thing, which is the best thing that you can do for a job is to network. And we begin that process very early on uh, in your law school career, and it continues. So we have a number of mixers and alumni events in which we invite students. When I go uh, across the state and when I travel to Atlanta or other places, uh, if we're having an event in town, we invite our students to come who are from those areas. Uh, we recognize that when we admit a student that our responsibility just starts. So it doesn't end when Laura and Darren and Alana and our admissions office admits a student to come to Stetson. That's just the first part of the process. We have a responsibility to our students to help them become successful. And a big part of that is helping them to network uh, in the areas in which they want to practice, whether it's substantive areas or geographic areas. 
We have a couple of questions here, um, and one of them that I think I'd like to take is about the timing of admissions decisions. Just so everyone knows, Stetson does a rolling process. We do have a rolling process. In fact, we opened the admissions application cycle on October 1, and we have been reviewing files ever since. Um, I'll probably take a little bit of a break over the, the, the winter break, I think. I might give myself a little bit of a vacation. But we're a school that as soon as we make a decision, we will send out the decision. We do it by email. And for admitted students, we also send you out a packet. If you have a question about your admission decision also, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Darren and Alana will counsel students about how to strengthen their file or even to request reconsideration. The next question I have here is about grades and exams. This is exam time, and if you come to campus in the next couple of days, you're gonna see some stressed out 1Ls in particular. Um, I was hoping the dean would tell us a little bit about how, how are law school classes um, graded, and um, what are some of the assessment methods that we use? I'm sure you've always heard, uh, or if you've watched the paper chase or read 1L, or you've always heard about the traditional way that we assess students, uh, and that's through an exam at the end of the semester. That continues to exist, uh, but law schools also, and particularly Stetson, uh, has evolved in terms of how it, it grades students. It's no longer, in many cases, that one exam fits all at the end of the semester. It's about multiple assessment tools as we go on through the semester, whether it's through a drafting exercise in a property class, uh, whether it's an oral advocacy piece in legal research and writing. Many of the assessment tools that we have uh, allow us multiple times in which our faculty members can interact with and assess our students. So there are still some classes that have the traditional law school exam at the end of the semester but virtually all of them have different ways to be able to assess students. Whether it's a problem-based assignment that exists in class or outside of the classroom. You know, the thought used to be uh, that the law practice existed by lawyers sitting in their offices by themselves and working out a solution to a problem. And that is no longer the legal market that exists in the marketplace. The marketplace requires lawyers to be able to interact with lawyers. It requires lawyers to be able to interact with other professionals in other disciplines, whether it's doctors or accountants or actuaries. We give students the opportunity to be able to do that while they're here at Stetson. The reason why we do that is because it continues to exist uh, in the marketplace that exists outside of the law school environment. So that people work on teams, they work on multidisciplinary teams and interdisciplinary teams. And we're engaging in that process while we're here in law school. And that's another way that our faculty members uh, can help assess students as part of the grading policy. So we have, I think, uh, evolved as a law school. Uh, as much of the legal profession has evolved, law schools continue to evolve. And one of the ways that we do that is through our exam and grading policy. You know, what I think I'm hearing as underlying that question is law school exams are a very stressful time for students. So how do we help students get ready to take those exams? And a big part of that is our academic success and bar preparation program. Our students, it used to be that if you existed in law school, and for any of you who've watched the paper chase, it used to be look to your left and look to your right. A student is not going to be here when you graduate from law school. Um, that is not how we approach things at Stetson. We have an academic success program. It helps students become successful. Our expectation when we admit a student is that they become successful in law school and they become successful in the practice of law. And so we have an academic success program that, put on, that puts on programming for all of our students that allows students to be able to successfully take exams. So it's not just in the first semester you sit down and write an exam and you hope you do well. We have lots of different programming that exists throughout the semester that allows students to be able to learn the skills that are necessary to be able to be successful in law school. Uh, our bar preparation program is, in addition to the traditional bar exam preparation materials that exist, uh, we have our own program and spend an enormous amount of resources. We recognize that that responsibility that I was talking about a little while ago is that for you to be able to be successful in the legal practice and in the legal marketplace, you have to be able to pass the bar exam. So we have, we have classes. Uh, that exist in the law school environment that are both doctrinal and skills-based. Uh, and we have a bar preparation program that helps students to become specifically prepared to be able to pass the bar exam. Last year's bar passage rate uh, for Stetson was 89%, something that we are enormously proud of. 
but we also recognize that it's not 100 percent and we'll work with those 11 percent of the students uh, that weren't successful the first time around to help them become prepared to pass it the second time around. I'm actually really glad that you brought up the academic success program because we have two questions up here about graduation rates and attrition rates and one of the things I love about Stetson is we graduate our people and I don't know the data off the top of my head I'm not quite sure if you do Dean but um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the graduation rates attrition here at Stetson. I think we've done a, a fantastic job in large part because of the academic success program that we have. So not only do we help students prepare to pass the bar exam, but we have, we have programs that exist for students that are at risk while they're here in law school. We have programs for people, we were talking, Laura, a little earlier about non-traditional students. Well, they haven't been studying in a long time. And so we have programs that are designed for non-traditional students to get back involved in uh, what is a, a fairly complex way of getting back involved in, in education itself and particularly in legal education. So we have a, our attrition rates and our graduate, our attrition rate is low, our graduation rate is high. Uh, and the reason why those are are because the resources that we put into the programs uh, that help us to become and help the students uh, to be able to pass the bar exam, and to be able to continue in law school. Our attrition rate uh, is very low. The graduation rate is really high because we recognize part of that responsibility that I keep talking about. So if you're taking a theme from everything that we've been talking about, uh, it's the responsibility of the law school. It's the responsibility that we have as an institution to help you become successful, pass the bar, and become, whether it's a lawyer who practices in the traditional law firm, whether it's someone who becomes involved in public service and pro bono activities, or whether it's someone who wants to wants the law degree because it enhances their skill set to be able to become involved in business. Uh, we provide all of those opportunities here at Stetson. That's great. I think that um, we have three particular questions up here that I want to tackle next, and they're each about particular subject areas. The first one is about our higher ed law program. Um, do you, um, can you expand a little bit on what is that and what are some of the offerings we have? Well, we have, first of all, it starts with our fantastic faculty. So, uh, Laura, I don't know how long we've been talking so far, but I can't believe that I've been talking as long as I have without mentioning our fantastic faculty. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it starts with, with people like Professor Peter Lake, uh, who is uh, the head of our Center for Excellence in Higher Education. Uh, Professor Lake is recognized uh, not only in this country, but, but really around the world uh, for his work in higher education law. So we have a conference every year in which we train people across the country, train uh, general counsels and lawyers that exist in different organizations and different universities throughout the country because we have such a broad expertise. You know, we also have a very extensive student services program here at Stetson. In large part, it's because of Professor Lake's work uh, that, helps, that helps us design a program that helps students uh, at a time of need. So we have a fantastic uh, student life department. And a lot, of those, a lot of the things that we develop as part of that is the result of what comes out of higher education law because we have a fantastic expertise in higher education law. We do a lot of scholarly work. Uh, we have a number of different centers for excellence. It includes higher education, it includes international law, it includes elder law, and it includes advocacy. So maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about those a little bit later. But higher education law is one of those opportunities that our students have and the offerings that we have that benefit not only the students that exist here, but benefit not only benefit the universities in the state, and benefit universities throughout the country. We've actually been very fortunate that we've sponsored a conference on higher education law and policy here in Florida for probably more than, I think it's over 20 years now. And so we bring a lot of practitioners into the area, um, but it's an important field. And um, I know I rely on legal counsel once in a while and it helps. Um, the next area is about environmental law, and Evans asked us the question about natural resources course. Do we have any plans to offer a course in natural resources? You know, we're always continuing to look at the curriculum. Uh, one of the things that I've asked the curriculum committee to do is to take a comprehensive look at our entire curriculum. We have just recently revised our first year curriculum, and we're embarking on a process to be able to continually revise the second and third year curriculum. And so a big piece of that is identifying the areas of practice, identifying the course offerings that we have that we don't have here at Stetson, and then being able to supplement those. We have a very good group of people in environmental law 
of our, our faculty members that are here at Stetson. So we will, we will consistently look at the individual offerings, whether in any substantive area, uh, in consultation with our uh, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs who looks at the schedule every year, works with our Registrar's Office, uh, and asks the students what areas that we need. So, you know, I spend a lot of time walking around, uh, I call it wandering around campus aimlessly, uh, although it's not really aimlessly. It's walking around campus to be able to interact and talk with our students. And so a big part of that is listening to our students and understanding what curricular offerings that they're looking for. So we'll continue to look at the curricular offerings that exist in environmental law with natural resources, as we will with all of the rest of our curriculum. We have two questions about the JD MBA. And yes, we actually do have the JD MBA program. It is a wonderful program with our School of Business in DeLand. And we have a couple of questions about that. Maybe you can tell the students a little bit about the program and what types of jobs does one get with a JD MBA as their degree? The JD uh, MBA program, I think, enhances the skill set uh, of anybody who comes to law school. Uh, we've had a substantial number of students that enroll in both the JD MBA program every year. You know, if you look at the demographics of where most students, law students, whether they come to Stetson or go to another law school, they tend to be practicing in smaller law firms, which means that not only do you have to understand how to practice law, but you also have to understand the business of how you have to practice law. And the JD MBA program provides that skill set, so it, not only are you looking at understanding how the legal practice works and, and the ability of our students to be able to interact with the interdisciplinary nature of what the law practice is all about now, but it's also the ability to understand how the business and how the economics of starting your own practice or working in a small firm in which you become managing partner in five years or in 10 years or in 15 years. It gives you the ability to enhance that skill set and we're continuing to work with the School of Business in DeLand uh, with their fantastic Dean Tom Schwarz uh, and I have been talking uh, pretty extensively over the last couple months about how we can even enhance further a program that I think is already fantastic. So we have been talking about creating more interdisciplinary work that exists so that our law students have the ability to interact with MBA students. Not just the MBA students that exist as part of the JD MBA program, but MBA students that are not part of the JD program. So we're looking for ways that we can interact uh, both in the Tampa community, in the Gulfport community, in those communities in which our students want to be able to practice law. And so the ability of our students to be able to network uh, in those areas, the ability of our students to be able to be part of the JD MBA program, you know, it's really a wonderful program because there's cross-crediting of courses. So if you took the JD program by itself and you took the MBA program by itself, you don't simply double the amount of time that it takes to be able to get two degrees. The ability of students to be able to cross-credit courses between the JD and the MBA program uh, allows the students to take MBA courses that are credited towards the JD degree. It allows the students that are part of the JD MBA program to take law courses that are also credited towards the MBA program. Great, thank you. I have a question up here that I did not forget, and this is from SC2K12. You asked us about out-of-state students and what kind of opportunities or transition assistance do we have at the College of Law? We do have quite a bit of things um, for students to assist them. Do you wanna talk a little bit about Ms. Tracy Rich and her services? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, we are very unique, I think, here at Stetson. All right, so if you haven't come to see our campus yet, you really could, should come to see our campus. Uh, it's not only a fantastic place to get a great legal education, but it's also a fantastic place to be. Uh, and so a big part of that is that this was built uh, in the 1920s as a resort hotel. Uh, it was built as a resort hotel, and it still looks like one. Uh, so as a result, we have a number of opportunities for students to be able to come and actually live on campus. So we have uh, in the neighborhood of 45 or 50 houses that the College of Law owns that are available for rent to students. Uh, we also have an apartment complex that is two blocks away from campus uh, with another 50 or so uh, apartments. Uh, and we also have dorm rooms that are here on campus that used to be old suites that existed as part of the hotel when it was built in the 1920s. So one of the best uh, features about Stetson, I think, is that we make transition very, very seamless uh, because you, there is the ability to be able to live off campus. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for students to live in, in private housing or private apartment complexes. But we also have the students, also give the students the ability 
to be able to live on campus. Uh, it makes the transition so much easier because the only thing you have to worry about is buying books for your first semester and showing up for class and we can take care of the rest. And as part of our admitted students portal, we actually have a section called, I think it's called Life at Stetson. We have some really cool blog information. We have links to things to do in the area. Um, we have local accommodation information. And um, the students actually are going to be kind of matched with student ambassadors. And one of the things I love over and over every summer, the incoming students will talk to the ambassadors about the transition. And, and it's sort of a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring process as you make the transition. And also on our admitted students portal is what we call gap content. Everybody always says to me, what should I do over the summer to get ready for law school? What should I read? Is there anything you suggest that I do, like watch a movie or read a book? Or should I get a, a law dictionary and memorize some terms? Um, what we've done is we've put together a whole collection of some, some things that you can do to get ready for school in August. And that includes the, the transition process, um, as well as some things like a, um, a roommate's wanted list. All that kind of stuff is on our portal. Okay, the next question we have that I think we should talk about right now is actually scholarship related. And I'm gonna go ahead and take this one. And the question is about the timing of scholarships. This year so far, we have made all of our scholarship decisions at the time of admission. Um, we hope to continue to, to do that. I think it really depends on the volume of applications as they come in and, and our ability to continue to get the faculty together over break. But it is our hope that as we send you your admission offer, we will send out a scholarship offer. If you have questions about scholarships and your potential eligibility, please don't hesitate to contact us. I'm always really happy to, to speak candidly with a candidate and go over their file with them. So let's throw another one out at the dean. And we have a question here about the pros and cons of taking summer classes versus finding a job opportunity or an internship. What are your thoughts on summer classes versus working versus internships? You know, I think as, as I've been talking about how legal education evolves, uh, I think that's in large part about how we think about the summer program, uh, which is the opportunity for students to become involved in the workforce uh, is a fantastic opportunity in the summer. So we not only uh, have the ability for our students to be able to work in private law firms in the traditional clerkship model, uh, and our career development department, our career services department, continues to work with students on the traditional clerkship model. Uh, but we also have a number of offerings in the summer uh, through clinical experiences. Those are ones in which you are technically taking classes at the law school but are actively involved in the legal community. So whether it's being involved in the prosecution clinic or whether it's involved in the family law clinic or the tax clinic, all of those students give, stu give all of those activities give students the ability to be able to interact in the, in the legal community. Uh, sometimes those are much easier to do during the summer than they are during the semester, uh, in large part because you have large blocks of time that you can be able to devote to clinical studies, uh, internships, and externship programs. So we have continued to expand um, internships and externships, so placements that exist um, in various places. So we have a number of students that, a couple of students, for example, that are at the Florida Supreme Court uh, doing an internship program. We have those programs that exist as part of a semester-long program where you're housed in a nonprofit organization or governmental agency. Those exist both in the summer, those exist during the semester. Summertime is one of those opportunities, I think, where students have uh, from mid-May until early part of, of August to become very engaged and very involved in the community. One of the, and, and specifically, the legal community and the legal marketplace. So we do have some classes that exist on campus for students to be able to take the traditional doctrinal courses. Uh, but our goal is to be able to increase the amount of skills-based training that exists in the summer because you can do it on an intensive uh, 10 or 11 or 12 week long program that allows our students to be concentrated on one particular area and help them get ready for the marketplace. We have another question, um, from, it's from CPAL, and this question is about whether or not we have a certificate in intellectual property. And I think since we're talking about certificates, we should also expand on some of the ones that we do offer. So let's start with IP and then maybe talk a little bit about the other ones we offer. We, we do have a number of concentration programs uh, that exist uh, here at the College of Law. Uh, they exist in advocacy, they exist in uh, environmental law, um, they exist in international law, they exist in elder law, uh, they exist in social justice. You know, one of the things, one of the changes that we've made relatively recently uh, is adding a social justice concentration. 
you know, we are so actively involved in our community. We're very proud to be here in Tampa Bay. Uh, and I think Tampa Bay is very proud to have us, uh, in large part because of the amount of interaction that our students have in the pro bono community. You know, the responsibility that I've talked about before, uh, I think also exists for law students. That responsibility is to be able to provide services for those people that don't have the ability to do that themselves. So we have the responsibility as faculty members, we have the responsibility as an institution, uh, but students also have that responsibility, and in large part we created the social justice concentration to be able to recognize those students that want to become in, more involved in pro bono activities and pro bono opportunities. So we have specifically designed uh, a part of our curriculum that allows students to be able to concentrate in particular areas. Now, with respect to intellectual property, I, I believe we still offer the semester exchange with the University of New Hampshire. Um, and we have a, an internship program still with the University of South Florida. I believe that's with the Patents and Licensing Office. Um, so we have some coursework and we do have those other two opportunities, but we don't actually offer concentration in IP. Um, we have a question about our campuses. That can sometimes be a little bit confusing to students. What do we offer in Tampa? What do we offer in Gulfport? Would you be able to explain the differences? So most of our, our faculty are all housed in one place. They're all housed in our Gulfport campus, which is about a half an hour away from downtown Tampa Bay, uh, where we have another campus, the Tampa Law Center. Uh, all of the same faculty that teach in Gulfport also teach in Tampa. Uh, we have uh, many of our traditional courses are offered in, in both places. Uh, most of our programming is offered in, in Gulfport, uh, although we do offer uh, part-time programming and we offer evening programming that exists in our Tampa Law Center. So they're about 30 minutes apart from each other. Uh, we have a library uh, in both places. Uh, we have a fantastic facility that I've already described about, uh, about the Gulfport campus as a former resort hotel. Uh, but the facility in Tampa is built very much along the same lines so that we take the traditional courses. So students uh, who are enrolled in our part-time program take some of their course offerings in Tampa and some of their course offerings in Gulfport. And so because of the closeness of the two campuses, it allows our faculty the ability to teach in both places. So we don't have resident faculty that exist in Tampa and resident faculty that exist in Gulfport. We have one integrated faculty and part of our rotational uh, basis for our faculty members is that they teach in programs both in Gulfport and in Tampa. And so I consider the both campuses to be more of an integrated program as opposed to a separate program. Uh, but it gives us in Tampa the ability to interact with our legal community that exists in Tampa while still having the flagship campus that exists in Gulfport. I think that's important. A lot of our law students end up having internships or participating in a clinic in Tampa, and they take advantage of having the Tampa Law Library available to them, as well as the uh, assistance of our law librarians. And um, many of them choose to study there instead of even studying in Gulfport. So it's a great facility. We have a lot of student service offices there. In fact, Alana Forte is housed primarily in Tampa. So if you are in the Tampa area and want to meet with a counselor and can't get down to Gulfport, you can actually meet with her and she does whole evening hours. Laura, before we go on to that, let me sure. one more thing about our, about our Tampa Law Center uh, is that it houses a working court. So in Florida, uh, there, are, there are, just like in every place else, there are three levels of the state court system. Uh, the traditional district courts or the trial courts, uh, the appellate court, and then the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is one Supreme Court for the state of Florida. Uh, it exists in Tallahassee. There are five appellate courts that exist uh, throughout the state of Florida. Uh, and one of them is primarily housed in our Tampa Law Center. Uh, and so the second district court of appeals uh, is housed on the third floor of our Tampa Law Center. Uh, they hold hearings uh, in, our, in the courtroom that, exi that exists as part of our Tampa Law Center campus. And so we're one of the very unique places that combines a law school with a working, functioning court. Uh, we have a fantastic relationship with the second DCA and many of our students watch some of the arguments that exist uh, as part of their regular calendar. Mm -hmm. I think it's neat too because the judges and the attorneys come downstairs after working all day just about the time that our part-time students are starting class and they have a lot of interaction which has been pretty fun for the students. The other question we have here that I think is, is really going to be um, important as we become more and more a multilingual society is how helpful is it to have a second language and is there a demand for bilingual attorneys? Okay, so I can answer that in two words, yes and yes. 
in, in large part uh, because you know, the legal world is shrinking. So we're in a globalized economy, uh, in one in which there are multinational corporations that exist in the United States or exist in South America or exist in Europe uh, that have operations that exist in another part of the world. And so the ability of our students to be able to interact uh, both here in the United States and abroad is something that I think is going to continue to be able to expand uh, over the next five, six, seven, ten years. Uh, the reason is is because the economy becomes more and more globalized. It has a need for attorneys that can be able to speak the same language that exists. And when I say talking about the same language, I'm talking about legal language and also language in the ability to communicate in a, in whether it's Spanish or French and also in English. Uh, this is one of those play, this is one of those areas in which uh, many, many students that exist that come from foreign countries have the ability to speak English. What is something that I think we, we would very heavily consider a, a very much a plus factor uh, as part of our admissions process is the ability to be able to speak in another language. Because after all, it's the ability to be able to get that job that you want, that dream job that you want, whether it's your first one from law school or whether it's someplace further down the road. Uh, and so the language facility, the language ability certainly helps. But I think that also leads us to a discussion about our international offerings. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a wonderful uh, variety of international law courses that exist here on the Gulfport campus. It's one of the areas in which we have defined as one of our centers for excellence, and that is in international law. Uh, but the other part is the traditional summer programs that exist and where Stetson has them. Uh, so before I get to those, um, we do have a semester-long program that exists in London. We have it every fall semester. Uh, it is, uh, the resident director is a Stetson faculty member. Uh, and our students, many of our students, participate in the, the semester abroad program that exists in London. Uh, a group of students just came back, uh, 35 or 40, that participated in our semester abroad program in London. Uh, but we also have a winter break program in the Cayman Islands. So that exists, well, uh, very soon, right after exams end here. <laughs> Uh, we have a spring break program this year in Ireland, as well as the traditional summer programs that we have every year. So we have one in Spain, uh, we have one in, in The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, we have one in Buenos Aires, uh, and we have one in China. Am I missing any? We have the the Hague program. I believe also splits with somewhere else. I want to Geneva. Say Geneva. It's that's in Geneva. it. That's right. We also have two exchange programs. Um, three exchange programs. We have an exchange with the University of Granada, mm -hmm. which is a full semester. The University of Toulouse in France, as well as and I'm blanking on the name. I think it's Victoria University mm -hmm. in Australia. And finally, for those of you who have an interest possibly in maybe practicing in the European Union or Spain, we actually offer. Um, two different dual degrees. One is the JD Grotto and Derecho, which is two years here at Stetson, two years at the University of Granada, allowing you to um, practice here in the States as well as Spain and ultimately the EU. And then the JD Masters of Law with the uh, university in France, and I'm blanking on the name right now. I don't know if you remember the name, but I'm blanking. <laughs> We'll figure that we'll one figure out. We'll figure it out. It's, it's if, in you, our, if you want to know, send us an email. Yeah, it's in our view. It's in our view book. It's in our brochure. <laughs> All right, we have we have another um, great question, and this is about working. Can one else work full time or excuse me, part time? Well, that's something that has evolved. Uh, also, uh, in general, uh, we encourage our students not to work during the first year. Um, there are specific exceptions, but the general rule is that that law school. Uh, in the first year is really a full-time program. Uh, and we'd hope that the students that enroll here find ways to be able to get their affairs in order so that they have the ability to spend full time uh, devoted to their studies while they're in the first year. And I actually like to expand on that. If you're someone who's coming to law school and wondering, should I, should I stop working and go to school full time? Or should I continue to work and go to school part time? I think that's really where speaking with current students and maybe even some alumni would come in handy. And if you want to know um, a little bit more about that, please let us know. Uh, Darren Kettles is um, our associate director, as hopefully you all know. And he's always happy to get you paired up with a current student um, who can kind of guide you through um, some of the things that are, are, are easy to manage and more difficult to manage and help you plan that out. 
Okay, we have a question about housing in Tampa. No, unfortunately, we don't have student housing near the Tampa Law Center. Um, however, I, I believe that Tracy Rich, our residential life manager, has some information about rental properties in that area. And we have a question about diversity on campus and what kind of student organizations we have here. I think we're up to 44 or something like that now. 44, so 44 student organizations. Uh, diversity on campus, I think, is, is wonderful. Uh, and I think we do a fantastic job uh, of having a very, well, a diverse class defined very, very broadly. Uh, last year, our class was 26%. 25. 25 percent of our class um, came from diverse backgrounds. Uh, so in, instead of just looking at the traditional diverse backgrounds, which that number represents, uh, it goes back to the classroom environment. Those students that come from diverse backgrounds, as I described before, whether they're geographical diversity, socioeconomic diversity, all of those, I think, enrich the classroom environment. So we are very much committed to a diverse community uh, defined both narrowly and very broadly. Uh, and something that I think is very attractive about Stetson is that it's such a welcoming environment, not only from a diverse perspective, uh, but one of the things that uh, I keep hearing when I travel around the state, when I talk to students on campus, is, is Laura and Darren uh, as they meet people and Alana as they meet people uh, talk about the fantastic things that exist here at Stetson. Uh, and I always, uh, you always wonder as part of the admissions process, is it really the same as they described it when they're recruiting me when you get here on campus? Uh, and the answer to that question is absolutely. The thing that I can, the, the continuous thing that I hear whenever I talk to students on campus is, is it really like this when I get here? And the answer to that is yes. It is like they describe it as part of the admissions process. The worst thing that you can do from our perspective is make a decision to come to Stetson based on something that we told you that doesn't exist when you come here. So what we attempt to do as part of our admissions process is to make sure that you understand. We know that there's lots of choices to go to law school. Uh, we want you to recognize that Stetson, we think, has a fantastic educational program. But we want you to be able to make the decision based on a full set of facts. And so uh, we have faculty members that are willing to talk to our students uh, who are thinking about applying, that have already applied. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a fantastic admission staff that can help you through the process. Uh, but the bottom line is that we want to make sure that the reason why you're coming to Stetson is because of what we're telling you. And the reason why you're making the decision uh, is because you think that Stetson can offer you something that helps your legal career. And we're committed to doing all of that. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. And we have one about whether a law degree is useful for people who are thinking of maybe not practicing, or is it useful for other careers? So absolutely. Um, if you look at the marketplace that exists right now, it's not just a legal marketplace that we're thinking about. So the skills that you come that you that you are that you obtain in law school are skills that can be translated across the legal environment and the legal landscape, uh, as well as business. If you look at many CEOs. Of, of many businesses. They all have legal training. The reason why they become so successful is critical thinking. So law school, you've, always, you've heard the phrase before, right? You want to be able to think like a lawyer. Well, there's a lot of truth to being able to think like a lawyer. We spend a lot of time talking to you about substantive law, but we recognize that substantive law changes. Substantive law changes. I teach in the tax area. Uh, there are 10,000 tax changes that exist over the last couple years. Uh, it doesn't mean that I have to know what all of those changes are, but the key is being able to know where I find the changes. And that all is based on critical thinking. You know, lawyers, there wouldn't be such a societal need for lawyers if we had all of the answers to all of the questions. What exists as part of that process, that what exists in law school, is the transformation to be able to think differently about how you, appro how you approach a problem. So as a problem exists, lawyers think very critically about it. We have to be able to distinguish different cases. We have to be able to distinguish different statutes. Because if the question came up that fit within an exact case, or a question came up that existed within an exact statute, that wouldn't be society. Society exists in which there's a lot of gray areas. And lawyers fill in the gray with more black and more white 
so that we're able to come up with an answer. And that's the ability to be able to communicate in writing and to be able to communicate through an advocacy program. Lawyers are advocates for their clients. And what Stetson does very well is prepare students to be able to be written advocates and oral advocates. And we have a couple more questions that are actually um, around the topic of careers and mm -hmm. employment. One is about the employment rates, and the other one is about the location of our grads and where they most often work. Can you tackle that for us? Sure. Uh, so the employment, the employment of many of our graduates um, is throughout Florida. Uh, we have a high concentration of students that practice in the Tampa Bay area. We have a high concentration of students that practice in the Orlando area. And we have students that practice in all the places that you would suspect in Florida, um, in Jacksonville, in South Florida. We have a number of students that are practicing in Atlanta and Washington and New York. Uh, those are probably the areas in which many of our students practice. But if you look at the demographics of where our students come from, many of those students go back to the same areas in which, they, in which they've come. So it's not just the ability to practice in large metropolitan areas. Many of our students, as many students that graduate from law school now, are practicing in smaller firms in smaller towns, uh, which is why it's not only important to understand what the legal practice is like, but also the business of running a law firm. Uh, and so we, I think, have uh, programming that exists uh, to help our students to be able to prepare to practice law, to be able to be involved in the business world, uh, and the ability of our students to be able to do pro bono activities when they graduate. Our employment rates uh, are those that are very similar to the employment rates that exist in lots of other places. We have, I think, a fantastic career development staff that does a couple things. One is it helps to match up students with specific employers. Uh, and two is, to be able, is the ability of students to be able to put themselves forward as part of their portfolio so that when they have the interview, they have the ability to, uh, to come across well as part of that process. All of our students to interview for judicial clerkships, for example, uh, have mock interviews that exist. Uh, we have many mock interviews for our students if they take advantage of the counseling services that happen as part of our career development office. So all of our students that, uh, that are getting ready to go out to an interview, we think we provide a wonderful infra infrastructure that exists for our students to be able to have the skill base that they need to be able to communicate effectively with potential employers. We're just, um, we're just almost about out of time, and we have two things we want to tackle. We're going to take one more question, and then I have um, a favor to ask of all you guys out there, because this is the first time we've tried something like this, and we're really excited to do it, and we hope you're having a lot of fun. Um, I don't even think an hour is long enough to get through all the questions. So last question for tonight is, what does special what does Stetson Law specialize in? Family law is one of the things that's uh, um, Proverbs lady asked about as well as immigration law and um, please don't log out guys because I do have something I want to I want to do as a special thank you for all of you who stayed on with us tonight so Dean can you ask answer that final question and then I'm going to give my little my wrap up certainly well Stetson I think is probably best known uh, for the two things that help our students get ready for the practice of law and life after law school uh, and that's advocacy and legal writing so our advocacy program, uh, since programs have been ranked for the last 17 years, Stetson has been ranked first in the country for the last 14 years. Uh, if you take a look at the legal writing program, since they've been ranking legal writing programs, Stetson has always been in the top five. So we combine the traditional doctrinal background along with the skills-based program uh, that I think wraps up the whole educational process uh, so that students are ready you know, you hear about being practice ready. You hear about being practice ready for the marketplace. Stetson does that through the things that I think we do very, very well. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, a wonderful program uh, that exists in international law. We have an excellent program that exists in family law. We've, we've not had really an opportunity to talk about uh, our professors other than talking about Professor Lake a little bit earlier, uh, but we have 52 full-time uh, law professors that exist plus another 150 adjunct professors that are that are specific subject matter experts in a variety of different uh, substantive areas so I think if you're interested in a particular area we have not only concentrations in those areas but also a very wide variety of course offerings 
that revolve around some of the skills-based training that exists in both advocacy and legal writing. Thank you. Well, here, here's what I'd like to do. There are a few of you who have not had your questions answered, and, and you might have some other questions um, that, that you're going to think about. I actually have put my email up, and um, I would like to ask you to do me one favor. Email me, please, with your name and your email address which I guess I would have in the, re the reply, but we have a special thank you that we are going to send to you. I would also love it if you have any feedback about this um, interactive forum tonight, please send that to me. And finally, anything you think of in terms of questions, whether it's about admissions, there are some scholarship questions we didn't get to answer tonight about our curriculum, our alumni, go ahead and send them to me. Feel free to email me and I will get back with you at least in the next 24 to 48 hours. And having said that, I'd like to say thank you to our fabulous IT team. We have three of the guys back here who are handling all the wonderful behind the scenes support. And thank you for the Dean, to the Dean for coming out. I'm sure he wants to get home to the family. And um, thank you all for spending the hour with us. And I hope you all have a fabulous evening and good night. Thank you for watching Stetson Law Live. For more information, send us an email or give us a call. For your convenience, our contact information will remain on screen for the next few minutes. Be sure to check our homepage often for news, information, and updates. Thanks again. We look forward to hearing from you soon.